on their behalf. That's after a friend held a fundraiser for a woman's daughter who had special needs and allegedly pocketed the cash. Here and now, Stephen Miller has that exclusive story. <laughs> Ayla Tipple's daughter Sarah is an energetic child with a love of Tina Turner. She was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and vision impairment when she was just a baby. She is completely at the mercy of the people around her. So for someone to prey upon her, sorry, and to prey upon us, it's just really, really disheartening, and it has knocked us down a lot. Four months ago, the family found out she had outgrown her specialized medical equipment, and the family's wheelchair-accessible van was on the way out costs they'd have to cover out of pocket. We just did our own little rough calculation and said we're looking at around the higher end of $65,000 and oh my god what are we going to do? Ayla decided to make a post on social media asking for donations. A friend she's known since grade school offered to help. She held a 50-50 draw and sold cookie dough through a company specializing in fundraisers. The woman posted online that those fundraisers were a success, raising close to $6,000. She assured Tipple that she would have the cash soon. I messaged her wondering where it was. Was told that um, she had taken a nasty fall and she was waiting to get to the doctor and um, she had to check the post for the money order or whatever the company was sending. And as I said, that sent up a huge red flag. Tipple contacted the company herself. She says she learned that the company's policies were different from what the woman had told her. So Tipple decided to confront her about it. So I then sent her a pretty strongly worded message, um, just wondering what the heck had happened, where's the money. In a text response, the woman admitted to having spent some of the money on bills and health problems. The woman swore that she was a good person, but struggled with issues surrounding her father's death five years ago. We've been shown way more love and support than the negativity. Tibble says things have gotten better since her original post. A family has donated a used wheelchair accessible van and Sarah was chosen as the recipient for next year's Ride for Quinn, a fundraiser that honors the memory of Quinn Buck. Tipple says she believes that in the end, more good than bad will come from this situation, but she has some advice for families in similar situations. Have everything drawn up in an ironclad contract, have you sign it, have them sign it, and have it notarized. The woman who collected for the fundraiser declined repeated requests from CBC for comment. Meanwhile, the RCMP says they have received a complaint of an alleged fraud, they can't speak specifically to the case as it's an active investigation. Stephen Miller, CBC News, St. John's. A Portugal Cove St. Phillips man is still a few steps away from his dream of opening a legal weed store. The town's council voted against approving his business at their, at their meeting last week, and now he's facing a series of inspections and improve, uh, approvals to get his store on the right side of the law. Here and now is Kate McGilvery has more. Tom Clark wants this building to be his new weed store. This location is actually the perfect one, and I think it is. A lot of people in Portugal Cove think it is. The NLC thinks it is. National marijuana legalization is just about two months away, but Portugal Cove St. Phillips is still figuring out if they want it in their backyard. In one camp, people like Mike Murray, a business owner and president of the local Chamber of Commerce. It's another legitimate business in Portugal Cove makes sense. Uh, if uh, all the regulations are being followed, why not? He says the Chamber of Commerce will look at writing Clark a letter of support. The more traffic we have coming into Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, it's good for every business in the community. In the other camp, a group of concerned citizens who made a petition saying they thought the store would bring increased traffic and impaired drivers. That's proved to be a problem for Tom Clark. There is a petition from a few people in the community and the council has denied my application to have cannabis at this location at this time. So far, Clark's poured $125,000 into his idea. He says he's still cautiously optimistic that he'll be open for business on October 17th. This is only a small hiccup in the road, uh, this petition by a few locals. Uh, I plan to have a petition signed by half the population down here. If I don't have 2,500 signatures within the next two weeks, I'd be quite surprised. Though council did vote against him last week, Mayor Carol McDonald says their biggest issue is that Clark doesn't have all of his inspections done. We're all into uh, having business in the community. We're trying to encourage business in the community, in the town. So once he, he, he provides us with that, that uh, information, 
then there's, there's no reason why he shouldn't get a business permit. Then council votes again, putting Clark one step closer to his dream. Thanks to Newfoundland's time zone, he might be the first person in the country open for business on legalization day. It's a unique opportunity for me. It's a unique opportunity for Newfoundland to be the first place in, in Canada to sell recreational marijuana. It's a unique opportunity for Portugal Cove. Kate McGilvery, CBC News, St. John's. Harbor Grace firefighters were up early battling a house fire on Lady Lake Road. They were called to the scene just after 3 o'clock. Fire Chief Jim Barnes says when they arrived, heavy fire was coming from the roof and the back of the house. He says no one was home at the time and the single-story house was undergoing renovations. By 7.30 this morning, the scene was clear and turned over to the RCMP. Of course everyone's familiar with Mary Pratt's images, but you know, when I think of her, I go beyond that and I have so much admiration for the way she lived her life. One of Canada's great painters has died at the age of 83 after a lengthy illness. Mary Cr Pratt's unique talent catapulted her to the top of Canadian artistic royalty. Just ahead, we'll look at her life and her legacy. Well, workers at a fish plant in St. Albans are fearing for their future. The plant hasn't operated at all this summer, and some union representatives say the future is looking bleak. Here and now's Garrett Berry is in the community today and has the details. Try as she might, she just can't make the math work. If I got up this morning and my EI came in today, oh, here. time I paid my hydro bill, my phone bill, and my car insurance, so I got nothing left over. Once, she could rely on a steady paycheck, 20 years working at a plant that operated year-round. But now... Is there any work going to be going through our plant? Uh, as of yesterday, uh, we... No. Not this fall and probably not next fall. So she's borrowing money for groceries, gas, and prescription drugs. It don't give you the courage to get out of bed in the morning. You, you worry about all night. There's no fish being processed here today. Some workers have been offered hours at a nearby plant in Harbor Breton. It was there for them and after, you know, a very serious consideration by all of them, um, there was only a handful that was able to, to travel back and forth. So you're looking at about uh, close to three hours every day of traveling. The plant once employed about two dozen, so in a town this size, it's noticed. They want full-time employment and this community needs us. This is money uh, spent locally at our grocery stores, at our gas station, or, you know, they're able to secure their mortgages and so on. This building behind me is actually the property of the provincial government, but it's being leased to the Barry Group under a contract. The union here says that the contract contains promises about how much fish will be processed here, but right now they say that promise isn't being kept. We tried to find out why, but today we got no answer. To an automatic voice messaging system. We have the potential right here in Newfoundland and Labrador, right here in rural Newfoundland and Labrador, and I would call this area even remote, to be a thriving area. And um, with a sufficient volume of fish, we can get there. There are meetings this week between union officials and the Barry Group, and politicians here say the future of aquaculture is bright, but not everybody is sold. This time next year, where do you think you'll be if you had to guess? If I had to guess, I, I, I guess I'll be off on either John Low EI, if I get a project, get on the program, or I'll probably go to Alberta, which I really don't want to do, not right now. Garrett Berry, CBC News, St. Albans. A biotechnology company from this province has been approved for a genome project in New Brunswick. Sequence Bio says it will spend millions of dollars when it partners with three doctors in the Moncton area to collect DNA samples from 2,500 volunteers. The aim is to better understand, treat and prevent genetic diseases. The project was approved by Veritas Research, a nationally recognized ethics review board. Sequence Bio says their New Brunswick project mirrors proposals that have been submitted and rejected by the Ethics Advisory Board in this province. The company hopes a new genomics review board will be established for Newfoundland and Labrador and that it will approve the company's future proposals. 
oil giant Husky is apologizing today. The company that operates the Sea Rose floating platform had a near miss with an iceberg in March of 2017. The investigation into that incident was released today by the Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board. Here now is Ryan Cook joins us live. So Ryan, what did that report show? Well, it didn't paint a pretty picture for Husky, and it confirmed some of the things that we've already reported, that the iceberg came within a dangerous distance of the ship and that the crew ignored its own safety procedures. But it also said that Husky has owned up to its mistake and taken steps in the right direction since. That includes hiring a new VP for the Atlantic region, a man by the name of Trevor Pritchard. Now, I spoke with Pritchard just a few moments ago, and I asked him if it was difficult to own up to that mistake and how we can be assured that it won't happen again. Uh, we recognize that we, we did make that mistake. At the time, judgment was, was made, um, judgment call made at the night, and uh, that was a mistake, for sure. It's all about the culture of the people uh, that emanates from the top. This won't happen on my watch. It's hard to fathom just how close this was, but CNL OPB boss Scott Tessier told me it could have been a significant disaster, especially scary considering the 84 crew were told to brace for impact. CBC obtained documents last winter showing the decision not to disconnect the CROs was economically driven. They would have been out of production for six or seven weeks if they did disconnect. As punishment, they were ordered to shut down for nine days. Now, Pritchard told me today that if this were to happen again, they would disconnect the CROs in a heartbeat, no matter what costs were associated with that decision. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Ryan Cook. The community of Nain is getting a large donation, quite literally. The Salvation Army is, shipping a sh is sending rather a shipping container from Happy Valley Goose Bay to the isolated northern community. It's filling up fast, but those that took on the project are looking to squeeze whatever they can into the can. Jacob Barker. This sea can was dropped in Patty Penny's yard, and it's getting pretty full. It was dropped here after a recent visit she took to Nain the town her mother's from. While she was there, she met a man who had recently got his first apartment and was in need. She wanted to help. My original idea was to furnish that man's apartment, but then it just, the, the idea just kept growing and growing. Woodward's, a local company, chipped in offering to move the sea can. When it showed up and the furniture was put inside, that's when Penny realized she could do more. I didn't realize it was going to be so big. Others got together and began filling it with items people in Nain might need. Organizations and people from all around the area chipping in services and stuff to send. Oh my goodness. I have bedroom sets, living room sets, you know, area rugs, bedding, dishes, artwork, the list goes on. While some items are meant for donation, others will be sold off at a yard sale with the proceeds going to local charities. There's always uh, fundraising there for, uh, for travel, for when someone is sick or there's a death or a funeral expenses, something like that. Penny also wanted to help a man who she'd read about in the Labradorian, the local newspaper. He was collecting parts to assemble bikes for kids. Not a sh brand new shining bike, but something put together that they can ride around with the rest of their friends. That would uh, really, I think, make my day and his, because I don't think he knows anything about this yet. <laughs> yeah. And bikes they found. I'm actually picking up uh, a donation of bikes from our good friends here at North Mark. They've been so kind as to uh, make a donation. Those were picked up today and are being packed into the sea can along with the rest. Hopefully they'll go to some kid that needs it and they, they'll, they'll enjoy their, uh, what's left of the summer anyway, and uh, enjoy their new bike. Well, this shipping container is part of a larger campaign the Salvation Army is putting on right now to do positive things in the community. And they're saying this is just the first shipping container. They hope in the future there'll be more. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Point in setting up and taking several days to do a single painting because with four little children running around, that just wasn't possible. Her paintings transformed ordinary objects into works of beauty, some hanging in the National Gallery. Mary Pratt has passed away at the age of 83. Just ahead, we'll look at her life and her legacy.
My experience in Gander was deeply moving and it changed me forever. I have never, ever met anybody as nice as the people in Gander. You ought to be so, so proud of everybody here. We're so thankful. Welcome back to Here and Now. A St. John's painter who transformed ordinary objects and people into extraordinary works of beauty and color has died. Mary Pratt was 83 years old. She had been receiving palliative care at her St. John's home. The CBC's Angela Antle takes a look back at Pratt's life and career and her gutsy promotion of other local artists. In 2015, when Mary Pratt's paintings were first exhibited at the National Art Gallery, she was breaking new ground for others as the first female artist from Atlantic Canada to have her artwork celebrated by the National Institution. Rooms curator Marae Egan conceived that exhibit. She shows us our daily life. I mean, you go through a day and you recognize a Mary Pratt moment. And I think that's something that people um, value a, a great deal, to be reminded of the beauty and the pain um, that is involved in preparing a meal, the simple act of preparing a meal or the beauty of, a, of light going through a jar of jelly. I tried to do a painting every day 
there was no point in setting up and taking several days to do a single painting because with four little children running around, that just wasn't possible. I had to use the dining room table to feed them, and of course the house was fair game for the children, so I couldn't set anything up. I had to paint what I saw and do it right away. So they, the things were small and they were impressionistic. Emma Butler exhibited Mary Pratt's work in St. John's and has known the artist for decades. Of course everyone's familiar with Mary Pratt's images, but you know, when I think of her, I go beyond that and I have so much admiration for the way she lived her life. She was just so gutsy about everything that life had to uh, throw at her, so to speak. You know, she left a very genteel New Brunswick, came and lived on the banks of the Salmon Air River. She had four children. She carried twins, one stillborn and one just lived a couple days. She had two marriages, two divorces, my own marriage was in a state of flux, and Christopher and I were deciding whether it was going to be possible for us to live together anymore. Our ideas were very different, and we both seemed to need the isolation that all artists talk about. And as soon as I'd hung it on the tree and the light came through it, it was like a gift, because there it was. It was a sacrificial, almost Easter image. Once the children were gone, somehow or other we were expected to act as one, as a pair. We do this and we do that. And neither of us wanted to do that. We wanted to retain our individual ideas and our thinking. Mary Pratt supported many artists in Newfoundland and Labrador, and it was her energetic lobbying of provincial politicians that led to the creation of the room's art gallery, museum, and archives. She worked hard to get the rooms for us. It's amazing how many people don't know that she was the one who bullied the government, bullied those politicians. They had no choice. She just made sure we were gonna have it. So she could say the most outrageous thing, but I'm sure we all remember that self-deprecating little laugh that she'd have at the end. And so she got away with saying a lot of things that the rest of us never would. For Here and Now, I'm Angela Antle. Okay, so this yep. is the hive. It is official. Carolyn is one step closer to becoming a beekeeper. <laughs> yep. Coming up, it's uh, back to my backyard where 40,000 neighbors <laughs> will soon be moving in.
Brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. So before we get to the weather, Carolyn, I need to know about the bees. Tell me about the bees. <laughs> yes, the adventure continues. <laughs> the next phase now will be bringing the bees back home. So early this morning, Paul Din from Adelaide's Honey paid me another visit and delivered a new empty mm. hive that will become the home for the bees in a couple of weeks. So we surveyed the backyard at around 7 a.m. because the hive needs to go in a location that gets early morning sunshine. Mm. So if you haven't heard about this ordeal. Here's just a quick <laughs> recap of uh, what's been going on. Last week, we discovered that about 40,000 honeybees were living in the dormer of my house, and the experts at uh, Adelaide's <laughs> Honey carefully removed the bees and an abundance of honeycomb and then transplanted it to a new hive that is now at their property in the Goulds while I uh, fix the damage to the house. <laughs> uh, but then the bees will come back and uh, uh, this is what happened this morning. Okay, so what is the key thing to look for when choosing a spot for a hive? We, uh, we like to choose a spot similar to this where you don't have a lot of traffic, people walking in front of the hive, so there's no pathways or vehicles. Uh, you want the sun, the early morning sun, to hit them first thing in the morning, and that gets the bees active and they'll start foraging. And how does this spot look? It looks really good. It looks great. You've got the sun first thing in the morning right here, and uh, they're kind of secluded back here, and there's a lot of fencing around so and, and trees. So what bees will do is they like to fly straight out of the hive, but when you've got a you've got a barrier around them, they're gonna go up. And and that's what you want. You want them to go up and over the homes and then come back. So it's a good right. location. So this is the hive. We'll slowly take one frame at a time and actually put them in. The ones that are in the bottom box of the hive they're in now will go into the bottom and then we'll slowly bring and transfer the top box and then just put them back together and that will be their home. And you'll do it in the exact same order. The exact so. same order so that they, they won't notice any difference. Maybe, maybe a slight difference but mostly keeping them in the exact same order they have it ready for winter. Mm -hmm. I had to Tulip. put a little cameo of my dog, Tulip. So, uh, yeah, it'll be wow. interesting. You and Paul Din must be, like, really good friends at this point. You <laughs> must see him yeah. more than anyone else. <laughs> We've been hanging out a lot. There's so much to learn. And the next thing, the next project is to paint mm. the outside of the hive. So I get to do that myself. So I'm looking for design ideas, yeah. like what to do with the outside of the hive. Yeah, let us know. Yeah, I absolutely will. All right, so let's have a look at the weather now, shall we? And uh, the highs today, some nice temperatures on the island still. 27 degrees as the high in St. John's, 26 in Gander. So lots of mid-20s temperatures on the island. Not so much uh, in Labrador along the coast, much cooler there. But all of those heat warnings that have been in place are now over and that's because we have a bit of a cooling trend on the way. So having a look at tonight, we have some showers for the southeastern parts of Labrador as well for the island, the south coast and for St. John's overnight tonight, clearing for Lab West. So yeah, we do have some rain on the way, uh, two to four millimeters for the east, a low of 18 degrees, so it's still gonna be pretty muggy overnight tonight. Along the south coast, about five millimeters of rain overnight and five millimeters uh, for the Corner Brook area and up along uh, the Northern Peninsula. Chance of some thunder showers for St. Anthony and Cartwright and some very cool overnight lows for Labrador and clear skies. So this is how things will look tomorrow morning in St. John's. Going to start the day with some cloud cover and 17 degrees uh, and the south coast could see a little bit of drizzle in the morning and 17 uh, for western Newfoundland. Some showers to start the day there, much more to come throughout the day and uh, for Labrador, mostly a mix of sun and cloud uh, to start the day tomorrow. So you can see most of the action is on the island uh, tomorrow morning. Lots of showers there. Labrador is looking pretty clear, pretty quiet throughout the day. 
So yeah, heavy, heavy showers here and uh, along the Avalon Peninsula as well later in the afternoon uh, is when we'll start seeing that in the east. So five to 10 millimeters of rain later in the afternoon for the east, but could get up to 20 millimeters and some heavier showers. And for the Marystown area, about two millimeters of rain expected there. For central areas, highs 21 degrees, but in the afternoon, those temperatures are going to start to go down really, really quickly. And looking at about 10 millimeters of rain for the Twilling Gate area. And you can see the change in temperatures as you go west with this system. 17 degrees in Cornerbrook as the high tomorrow. 10 to 20 millimeters of rain expected for uh, the west coast and up the northern peninsula as well for the St. Anthony area. Very cool temperatures uh, at, for the Straits tomorrow. St. Anthony looking at 9 degrees as the high. Ooh, very cold, but and you can see how quiet Labrador is tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud and temperatures around 17 degrees across the board. So coming up a bit later, I'll tell you more about uh, this cooling trend that's on the way. Arianna. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, how many of you wanted to be an astronaut when you grew up? As you got older, you may have thought the idea was a little far fetched by hundreds of kilometers, but not Bethany Downer. The 24 year old has taken one giant step toward becoming this province's first astronaut. I caught up with Bethany in her old stomping grounds earlier today. We are here at the Johnson Geo Center and I am with Bethany Downer, an astronaut candidate for Newfoundland and Labrador. Bethany, what does that mean? Great question. So I'm very fortunate to have been selected as a scientist astronaut candidate for Project Possum, which is a non-governmental organization, a nonprofit based in the U.S. in Florida. Uh, it's supported by NASA and NASA astronaut instructors are there training the new generation of astronauts to go to space. So there'll be new suborbital commercial launch vehicles that'll be going into space in the coming decades. And we need some scientist astronauts that are trained to go there. So I'm very fortunate to be selected as someone who will begin training now next month. How big of a deal is this for someone to get to do the scientific research in space? Uh, fortunately, space is a great domain for a variety of research domains, um, but this in particular is fantastic in that it's actually climate change research that I'll be conducting. So by collecting data in the upper level of the mesosphere, right on the border of space, uh, this allows us to compile data and findings about climate change in general. Um, collection of data in space helps us with the future uh, exploration that will be taking place, whether it be humans or first, uh, future spacecraft. So all of it is very relevant but exciting. So what does it take to become an astronaut? Great question. Uh, I think the biggest thing is motivation. You really have to want to because I think if that's something that takes over everything else, there's nothing that can adhere or prevent you from doing it. Uh, and ever since a young age, I, I had my mind set on this and I'm fortunate that now anything that I've accomplished has been towards this. And even if that was the end goal, I made sure to try to enjoy everything along the way, whether it be different jobs, opportunities, people I've met. So I've tried to make the most of it as I've uh, come here. Uh, but now it's a, it's a great step and I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm thinking of, you must have to be okay with being in tiny spaces and eating food out of a tube. Is that, <laughs> is that too out there or, or is that reality? Well, there are things like this that we have to train for. So we'll be doing things like uh, spacesuit training, hypoxia training, egress training, things that'll take place inside an airplane, including acrobatics, dives and dips and flips to teach me and to learn how it feels when you're going up into space, coming back, the sense of weightlessness. So there are definitely new sensations that I'll have to get used to. Uh, fortunately, the type of training that I'll be doing, and if I ever get selected for a flight, uh, the flights won't be too long in nature. It's not like I'm going to the space station for months at a time. Uh, I was much more interested in something that would uh, allow me to be closer to home for as long as possible. And something really exciting happened recently where you actually got to put in your measurements for a space suit. So what was that like? I think I've described it as a mixed bag of feelings. Um, it was a bit emotional, uh, very exciting, but I was, I was very grateful. I think I tried to reflect on how blessed I was. There's been many people that have supported me from day one, and I thought that this was a, almost a symbolic step of where the next phase is going. So confirming that I'll have the Canada flag on my arm and confirming my measurements and my name was all very exciting. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to putting it on for the first time. So when do you think uh, we'll see Bethany Downer, first Newfoundlander and Labradorian, up in space? 
Hopefully within uh, the next decade or a couple decades, of course, this training takes lots of time. We'll be going back and forth to Florida over time. I have a bit of flexibility in terms of the training. Uh, I'm not in any rush, still wanting to learn and have new job opportunities, so I'm uh, definitely going to spread things out. Uh, but there's no rush. There's fortunately lots of time, but hopefully within the next few decades we'll have uh, that be possible. And one last question. Are you nervous going <laughs> up in space in one of those? Is that nerve-wracking? Uh, there is a degree of uh, nervousness, but I, I trust those, of course, that are behind all the team. Everything that happens in space requires people of all backgrounds and disciplines. It's very much a industry that brings lots of different people together. So I think I'd like to focus on the good that things do. Uh, and I focus on how exciting it is. And that helps. <laughs> well, thank you so much for thank chatting with me much. today. Absolutely. And good luck. Thank and who you. knows, maybe in a decade or so, we'll see Bethany Downer up in space. Thank you. A trash talker will actually be like a contact person, um, like a spokesperson. The town of Deer Lake is trying to recruit some trash talking neighbors. I'll tell you what that's all about. We have a breaking story for you now. Deanne Fitzpatrick, a Belle Island woman now living in Scotland, has lost her workplace harassment claim. Fitzpatrick said she experienced a decade of abuse while working as a fisheries officer at a Marine Scotland office, including an instance in which she was bound and gagged by male co-workers. The BBC is reporting that an employment tribunal has ruled against Fitzpatrick's claim of bullying and harassment. This photograph, which shows Fitzpatrick Fitzpatrick gagged and tied to a chair was not included in the investigation because it happened more than three years before Fitzpatrick's complaint was brought forward. Here at home, Fitzpatrick's family say they are hugely disappointed with the ruling. Volunteers in Deer Lake are talking trash tonight. The West Coast town is launching its new recycling and composting program, and it wants to recruit community members to help spread the word about recycling bottles, cans, and cardboard. Here now is Colleen Connors went to Deer Lake to learn more. Some communities on the province's west coast have launched this new recycling program with long lists of what's recyclable and what's not, and it can be quite confusing. But the town of Deer Lake are trying to put a stop to that by introducing some experts in trash. 
the town's summer intern had the idea to recruit community volunteers to be what she calls trash talkers. And a trash talker will actually be like a contact person, um, like a spokesperson um, for other residents um, that have questions or concerns about the program. By October 15th, residents of Deer Lake will have to sort this long list of recyclables curbside. The town's trash talkers will be educated in what goes in which bag and hopefully spread their knowledge to their neighbors. Vandenbrucke hopes her idea will cut down on phone calls to the town and the waste management office. Yes, yeah, so in Deer Lake, and especially coming from abroad, like social ties are really strong in this community. It's on the west coast of Newfoundland. Um, so we noticed kind of that people sometimes would go with questions to their like friends or family. The volunteers will be recycling ambassadors. These people too, they're gonna like carry out a program like or the public education part of it. So they will spread the word themselves being like a trash talker. So that will definitely increase uh, both participation rates as like public education in the community. This can go in, right? Oh yeah, okay, yeah. The more you know, the better. Because Deer Lake has added an extra element to curbside recycling, composting bins, collected every week. We have a compost site available already, so we are going to, like the finished soil is going to be um, like for use for the community. Anyone who wants to be a trash talker can go to the information session at the town hall tonight at 7. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Deer Lake. It was the largest online fundraiser in Canadian history. A campaign raised more than $15 million to help the families and victims of the Humboldt Broncos bus crash. Today, lawyers gathered in Saskatoon to figure out how the money will be spent. The court hearing was sparked by a law in Saskatchewan that regulates online fundraising. Olivia Stevanovich reports. This will be the first major test of Saskatchewan's crowdfunding legislation, the first of its kind in Canada. Over $15 million were raised for the victims of the Humboldt Broncos crash. 16 people died and 13 were injured in April after the team's bus collided with a semi-trailer, prompting the largest GoFundMe campaign in Canadian history. The money is sitting in a non-profit corporation called the Humboldt Broncos Memorial Fund. It will be invested in a high-interest savings account. A judge agreed to fast track a portion of the money today. Each passenger or the respective family will receive $50,000. This will help pay for travel and funeral expenses. A five member advisory committee will then decide how to split up the rest. Some family members were in the courtroom this morning to hear how the process will work. They're starting to make plans. It'll definitely allow us to move forward in some of the things that we want to do. Um, our son Evan was a pretty impactful young man and left his mark on the community in a lot of different ways and one of the things that we want to do going forward with all a lot of this is just be a little bit more philanthropic if you will with some of the things that come our way. Other provinces will be watching this case closely to see if they should enact their own crowdfunding legislation. While it doesn't set clear timelines for how long the money has to be rolled out, the lawyer for the Humble Broncos told the court today that he expects the money to be distributed quickly. A draft report with recommendations from the advisory committee is due by the fall. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Regina. It is a long journey, but now I'm you know, truly in, in my dream job. One of the best tennis players from this province who now rubs shoulders with some of the best tennis players in the world was back in St. John's today to talk to local tennis players. I'm Jeremy and I'll have that story coming up.
We're just about to get to the weather, but mm -hmm. we have one thing to show you first. So <laughs> as you may know, the annual rescue of the pufflings or baby puffins has been underway in Whitless Bay this month. The puffin patrol has just started its 14th season. However, this next video isn't the puffin patrol, but a woman who happened to stumble across a puffling. This video sent to us shows a puffling being rescued all after being found on the side of the road near Brigus. Yes, she uh, picked up the puffling in a hoodie, as you can see, and uh, just let him go in, in the water. And she must have known what to do because she does do the official thing to do. You don't toss them into yeah. the water. You just kind of gently lay go. them down. And Oh, oh my goodness. There, and there he there goes. He goes. <laughs> Safe and sound. I love the word puffling. Me too. It's so adorable. Pufflings. <laughs> so adorable. Well, uh, Gary, um, one of our, our my colleagues here in the studio just popped outside and uh, says that it's raining in St. John's what? now. We're just starting to rain, so we are going to be getting a little bit of rain overnight mm -hmm. tonight. If you have any evening plans, let's have a look at the satellite and radar. You can see the showers over the Avalon Peninsula right now and along the west coast. Not a huge amount coming uh, tonight, about two to four millimeters expected for the Avalon uh, as we uh, Head into uh, tomorrow and uh, this evening, Labrador uh, East, looking at some uh, showers overnight tonight as well. So this is how it's going to play out into tomorrow morning. The West Coast looking at some showers to start the day. A mainly cloudy day for the rest of uh, the island. Some showers there along the South Coast. But uh, yeah, that system is going to work its way east and uh, create some more showers for uh, most of the island, but looking nice and clear for Labrador tomorrow. So yeah, the Avalon Peninsula looking at about five to 10 millimeters of rain, but uh, could see upwards of 20 millimeters of rain and a high of 23 degrees for uh, central areas. Gander, Twillingate looking at about uh, 10 millimeters of rain tomorrow and on the west coast about five to 10 millimeters of rain. And you can see how these temperatures are really starting to cool uh, with the system that's coming through through and a change of uh, wind direction in Labrador. Pretty quiet day coming, uh, not much precipitation to speak of. Uh, temperatures in the mid teens to uh, upper teens there in Maine. So this is how it's going to play out uh, Thursday evening. Those showers are going to stick around. Lots of scattered showers and overcast for the island and a few showers for western Labrador as well as we get into Friday morning. But you can see it's going to be largely a very cloudy day, uh, particularly for the east. There could be some early morning showers for the east. 15 degrees <laughs> as the high for Friday afternoon. It's going to be a bit of a shock to the system, I think, with uh, all of the heat that we've been experiencing lately, this uh, big cool down that's coming. So central and the west coast also looking at temperatures just below 20 degrees and a mix of sun and cloud on Friday as you head into the weekend. For Labrador in the east, looking at 22 degrees as the high for Friday afternoon and 17 and a mainly cloudy day for Labrador west. So as we head, head into Saturday so far, things are looking pretty good in the east. A mix of sun and cloud and 19 degrees. Some showers and cooler temperatures moving in on Sunday and then clearing on Monday. So that's how things are going to play out uh, for the east. For central, looking at a nice stretch of sun and cloud for the next few days and temperatures around the 20 degree mark. Some showers on Saturday for the west and then clearing as uh, we head into Sunday and Monday. For Labrador, another stretch of a sun and cloud for the east and temperatures around the 20 degree mark. Looks like a little bit of a warm up coming uh, for Monday there and for Western Labrador, uh, some cloud cover on Friday and mix of sun and cloud on the weekend and the potential for some showers there on a Monday. And that's your forecast, Ariana. Back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, she works for the women, the tennis, the women's rather tennis association, rubbing shoulders with some of the biggest stars in the game. But before that, Melissa Pine was a nationally ranked player from this province who scored a full scholarship to the United States. Pine was in St. John's today speaking with budding tennis stars. Here now is Jeremy Eaton caught up with her on the court. Was not something that came very easy or very quickly. 
Uh, Melissa Pine found video. herself in a very familiar place today, on a tennis course. But instead of bashing balls, she was serving up wisdom, speaking to local players at Riverdale this afternoon. I wanted to combine my love of tennis with my education. So playing, uh, then earning you know, a business degree and then an MBA while I was coaching um, at Washington State, it was really my plan to be able to combine both. The former nationally ranked tennis star earned a $130,000 scholarship to Washington State University. But that's not enough to guarantee a professional tennis career. She played pro for a few years before trying to crack into the business side of tennis. I worked in you know, tech and IT industry and it, all in all it took me probably seven, eight years before I was able to get myself into a position where um, I had uh, earned a job at the USTA. So um, the USTA owns and operates the US Open. Pine is now the vice president in the Asia Pacific region for the Women's Tennis Association. She's also the tournament director of the WTA Finals, meaning she's rubbing shoulders with the likes of Serena Williams. It was extremely inspirational getting to hear her experiences and her stories and everything that she's accomplished because she's not only a role model for the Newfoundland tennis community, but also throughout Canada and around the world. Jasmine Rahman is no slouch herself. On Thursday, she'll travel to Quebec for the Under-16 Junior National Championships. Today, she got tips from one of the best tennis players this province has ever produced. Nice. She was telling us about um, how to just have a strong mindset and not worry about who's on the other side of the court and just play your game. Yes. For the past five years, Pine has lived in Singapore. Now part of her job is to grow the sport in Southeast Asia. On days like today, she's reminded of how great it feels to help grow the sport at home. Why am I not doing this in my own home? I mean, there's so many kids here aspiring to play tennis or aspiring in sport. And I really believe that sport is such a great tool for life. So to be able to come out here, talk to the kids today, um, share some of my experiences with them, you know, in hopes that I can maybe help them achieve some of their goals. One of the main points that Pine tried to drive home to the local tennis players today was that tennis is a great metaphor for life. Not only do you need to set big goals, but you got to put in a lot of hard work to achieve them. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. The Prime Minister of Italy is declaring a state of emergency in the city of Genoa. The bridge collapse there has claimed 39 lives and left 15 people injured. Rescuers are still looking for survivors. Well, the likely is rather slight and it shrinks with the passing of time, but we never lose the hope to find other people alive under the rubble. The Italian transport minister says the bridge operator will have to pay the cost of rebuilding plus some heavy fines. Italian rescue officials have released dramatic video showing a rescue from Tuesday of a person who was caught in the mangled ruins of their car and was stuck in the air when the bridge collapsed. The Democratic Party in Vermont has picked its candidate for governor and she's a historic First, a transgender woman is running for the state's top job. Vermont needs a 20-year vision. Vermont needs a vision that goes beyond the candidate, beyond the governor. And that's what leaders should be doing. Christine Hallquest beat three challengers and won the Democratic nomination last night. She becomes the first trans candidate for governor of a major U.S. political party. In November, she will go up against Governor Phil Scott, who's a Republican. We have another stark example today of the state of crisis in Venezuela. With the cost of system maintenance now out of reach, the taps have virtually run dry at one of the biggest public hospitals in the capital, Caracas. Most bathrooms are closed and patients rely on jugs being refilled from a lone spigot on the ground floor of the facility. There are concerns the discolored water that trickles out may contribute to health problems. Up to 75% of residents of Caracas now say that they have no regular access to running water. It's the latest calamity for Venezuelans enduring a fifth year of economic hardship that has led to food shortages and hyperinflation. 
Here's a look at today's viewer photo of the day. Isn't Ooh, that cool lovely? Cool rock form formation. Yeah. That is neat. Any idea where this? Uh, it's in the east. In the east? Yeah. I don't know. People who live in the area will know this rock formation for sure. It has a great name. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'll have the answer after the break. <laughs> All right, so let's get right to our viewer picture of the day in area. And you to guessed be fair, it. I guessed it. Shag Rock. <laughs> Shag Rock. Dildo? Uh, White Way. White Way. Yeah, that's the area there. Fantastic shot of some folks out fishing. Thank you very much to Kathy Williams for sending this in to uh, our uh, email address, nlphotos at cbc.ca. All right, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night.